Data replication ensures safety of data against undesired events such as crashes and it can also provide high availability for massive load. In order to keep the replica servers updated, PostgreSQL provides a standard feature called streaming replication. This feature implements a mechanism to continuously ship and apply the wall records to some number of standby servers. Before we get started, let's see what capabilities streaming replication can bring to the system. First, we have failover. When the primary server fails, the standby server can take over the operations. This means that we can build a highly available system that can continue to operate even if a failure occurs. Then, we have load balancing. This means that read-only queries can be distributed among multiple servers. PostgreSQL streaming replication is implemented using a master-slave configuration. The master, also known as the primary instance, is a read-write server, whereas the slave is a read-only server. However, standard PostgreSQL doesn't have a distribution feature that considers the load on the servers and where to send a certain query. For that, we'll have to use load balancing tools such as pgpool or haproxy, which are open source extensions. These tools can efficiently distribute the load between the PostgreSQL instances. The lag on streaming replication is normally very short depending on the network speed, database activity, and standby settings. Also, the replicated changes can be as small as a single transaction. Therefore, the load on the primary for each standby is minimal, allowing a single primary to support dozens of standbys. Streaming replication is asynchronous by default. Therefore, the primary server doesn't wait for a confirmation that the changes were applied to the standby server. It sends back a response to the client when it completes the processing on the primary server. So, the overall response time is about the same as when streaming replication is not used at all. However, since wall shipping or data update on the standby server is done asynchronously, the updated result on the primary server may not be immediately available on the standby. So, depending on the timing of a failover, data could be lost. Thus, this kind of replication is suitable for replication to remote areas for disaster recovery. It can also be useful for operations such as data migration and data loading in reporting systems. For critical systems, we can configure the replication to be synchronous. In this case, the primary server waits for a response from the standby server before completing the process. Therefore, the overall response time includes the duration for log shipping. However, since there is no delay in while shipping, data freshness of the standby server is improved. As a result, the system will be suitable for failover and for read-only load balancing distribution. Still, we need to be careful when choosing the sync mode since it affects the response time of the SQL processing and high availability. Therefore, we should consider that even in a critical system with critical transactions like a bank application, only a certain portion of the transaction can be very critical. In this case, a synchronous replication configuration can also support asynchronous transaction so that not all changes need to wait for a confirmation from the standby server. This means a mix of synchronous and asynchronous can be used in the same system and can be selected based on how important the data in a particular table is. Before we get started with configuring PostgreSQL for streaming replication, it makes sense to take a look at what we want to achieve. The goal in this tutorial 
is to create a primary server that replicates data to a standby using asynchronous replication. First, we're going to create the primary instance. For this, we're going to use the initdb command tool included in the PostgreSQL installation to create a new PostgreSQL database cluster. If you installed PostgreSQL correctly, you should have access to this command. Then, creating a database cluster means that we create the directories in which the database data will live, generate the system tables, and also create the default database called Postgres. Basically, a database cluster is a collection of databases which are managed by a single server instance. So, I'm going to build the collection of databases for the primary server. initdb minus d and then I specify a directory which doesn't necessarily need to exist. tmp slash primary underscore db. There are four things we have to do on the primary server. We can perform them step by step. The first thing is to change the PostgreSQL configuration file. Here, I'll use the nano tool to make the changes, but you can use any tool you like. That file will be found under our chosen directory, in this case, tmp primary db, then slash PostgreSQL config. First, we'll have to change the parameter called listen addresses. By default, PostgreSQL only listen on the localhost. Remote access is not allowed by default for security reasons. Therefore, we have to teach PostgreSQL to listen on remote requests as well. In other words, listen addresses parameter defines the bind addresses for our database servers. Without it, remote access is not possible. So, the star symbol here means that this server can listen to any connection. Then, since in this tutorial we'll work on the localhost, we'll have to change the ports to avoid a conflict. So, we change it to 5433. Ctrl X to exit. We will save the file. Yes. And now, to start the database, we can use the pgctl command pgctl minus d, the directory of the database, and then start. Then we can already create the replication user in the database. First, we connect to the default database called Postgres, psql minus minus port 5433, then the name of the database, Postgres, then create a user, rep user, and here it's important that the user has the replication flag set. Of course, we could also set a password here. The basic idea is to avoid to allow the admin user to stream the transaction log from the primary to the replica. The next thing to do is to control who is allowed to connect to PostgreSQL and from which IP. We do it via the host base authentication configuration file. So, nano tmp primary db pg underscore hba dot config. Normally, we would add another line here specifying the replica host. However, in our setup, both the primary and the replica are on the local host. Therefore, in this case, we'll change only the user to allow the rep user coming from the local host to log in and stream the transaction log from the primary. Finally, we should restart the server because we have made some changes in the PostgreSQL configuration file. If you only changed the pg underscore hba configuration file, a reload will be enough. So, pgctl minus d tmp primary db restart. Our primary system is now ready 
and we can focus our attention on the replica. The next step is to create the replica. If the replica already exists for you, you must make sure it is stopped and the data directory is empty. In our case, we don't have yet any replica, so we'll create one using the primary instance. To do that, we'll use the pg underscore base backup command, which will connect to the primary and simply copy all the data files over to the replica. pg underscore base backup minus h localhost. The connection has to be done as the rep user. Then, to ensure that the copy process starts instantly, it makes sense to tell PostgreSQL to quickly checkpoint. The minus D flag defines the destination directory where we want to store the data on the replica. Then, the minus R flag automatically configures our replica for replication. Finally, we create a slot with minus minus slot and give it a random name. Then minus C, this is necessary so that the primary can recycle the wall file only after the replica has fully consumed it. And the port is 5433. Now let's see what this command has done. In another window, we move to temp replica DB and we list all the files. The pg baseback command has copied everything over. The configurations have been taken from the primary. However, there is more. For example, the standby.signal file has been created and it tells the replica that indeed it is a replica. Finally, the tooling has adjusted the postgresql.auto.config file which happens to contain all the configuration to make the replica connect to the primary server. Still, since we run on the same localhost, we need to change the ports to avoid a conflict. So, nano postgresql.config We search for the port Ctrl W port 5.4.3.4 Now we are done and we can proceed to start the replica. pg underscore ctl minus d tmp replica underscore db and start. Once the setup has been completed, it makes sense to take a look at monitoring. In general, it makes sense to use tools such as pgwatch2 to continuously monitor the database. But now, we will do it manually. First, let's check the primary. psql postgres minus minus port 5433 We switch to the extended mode. Select all from pg underscore stat underscore replication. The existence of a row in this table tells us that the wall is flowing from the primary to the secondary. However, we can also make a check on the replica. PSQL Postgres and the port is 5434. We switch to the extended mode and now we select from pgstat underscore wall underscore receiver. We have a row in this table and this ensures that the wall receiver does indeed exist and that the data is flowing. Of course, we can also try a simple real-life example. We create a simple table on the primary, create table, table, with ID as integer, we insert some rows in the table, insert into table, values 1,
and value 2. Then we select the record. Now we can check the replica to see if the data has been replicated. We see that we have the data on the replica as well. Let's also try a delete on the primary. It was replicated. And finally, let's try the truncate operation.